World War II is probably the most studied, analyzed, and widely known catastrophe in human history. This is partly because of just how huge the thing was, and partly due to the technology available at the time. We have photos, video, audio recordings, newsreels, newspapers, all documenting every detail, every day, every moment. However, despite these incredible tools and years of study by the greatest historical investigative efforts in the world, there's still plenty of mysterious things that occurred we simply do not have the answers to. In today's episode, we're going to examine some of the more mysterious elements of the Second World War, tales where the truth is clouded or obscured. From accusations of espionage to conspiracy theories of murder, here are four enduring mysteries of the Allies in World War II. Welcome to Wars of the World. In the immediate months after their attack on Pearl Harbor, the forces of the Japanese Empire appeared almost unstoppable. Replicating Germany's blitzkrieg across Europe, they stormed through Asia and the Pacific, capturing key strategic objectives such as, among others, Singapore, Hong Kong, and the Philippines. Not only did each of these victories damage the strategic Allied position in the theater, but they also dented public morale in the United States, and fears that eventually Japanese troops would land on their west coast seemed very real in early 1942. Something had to be done, and it had to be spectacular. That something came in the form of a now legendary air raid on the Japanese home islands, led by the enigmatic Colonel James Jimmy Doolittle on April 18th, 1942 a force of 16 B-25 Mitchell bombers took off from the aircraft carrier USS Hornet and flew off into history as they conducted the first air raid on Japan of the war. Given the expense of the operation and the risk involved to the ships, aircraft, and of course, the men, the raid achieved very little in terms of actual damage to Japan's war effort. However, it sent US morale soaring, convincing everyone that Japan was not some unstoppable monster and could be beaten back. For the Allies, therefore, the importance of the operation in 1942 was immeasurable. These B-25s were not carrier aircraft, instead being lightened enough to just barely get off the deck of the ship, but no consideration was given for allowing them to land back aboard afterwards. The army bombers were simply too big, therefore, Returning to the Hornet after the operation was out of the question, so instead the pilots were instructed to meet up with allied Chinese units operating against the Japanese in mainland China. Being forced to launch early after being sighted by a Japanese vessel, none of the raiders had the fuel to reach their intended airfields in China, instead crashing as their engines stalled after the crews had bailed out. However, one aircraft did land safely, just not in China. Aircraft number eight, flown by Captain Edward J. York, landed his aircraft at Vladivostok in the Soviet Union. While considered one of the big three allied powers, the Soviet Union was not in the same boat as the UK and US in terms of the wider war. The Soviets were interested in combating the Germans in Europe and had signed a non-aggression treaty with Japan prior to Pearl Harbor. Therefore, the appearance of a B-25, which had just bombed Japan, was not a welcome one for the Soviets, and so York, his aircraft, and his crew were all interned and held by the Soviets for over a year before they were released via Iran. York's reasoning for landing at Vladivostok was simple enough. He recognized that they lacked the fuel to make it to the Chinese lines, and so he diverted to Vladivostok in an effort to save him and his men. He believed that being allies, at least in Europe, meant that the Soviets would refuel his aircraft and allow them to fly onto China. But of course, this was not the case. This is where the mystery comes in. 
because speculation has surrounded the landing ever since that York was ordered to land in Vladivostok as a test of Soviet sympathies towards the Allied war effort in the Pacific. At the time, not possessing land bases close enough for their heavy bomber aircraft to strike Japan, there was some serious consideration made to requesting permission for US bombers to fly from Soviet territory. If York and his aircraft were aided on their way by the Soviets, it would open the door to other flights. This theory has long been denied by authorities and York himself, but there are a number who believe it to be true. Perhaps the most intriguing of which is York's own navigator on the flight, Lieutenant Nolan A. Herndon. At a reunion of those who took part in the raid years later, Herndon asked Doolittle if their landing at Vladivostok was deliberate, to which his former commander emphasized that he didn't order them to, which Herndon took to mean that Doolittle knew someone else who had. There are other curious details regarding the flight, such as the crew being cobbled together at the last minute and the plane not receiving modified carburetors, which the other planes had been given to increase their range. Supporters of the theory that the landing in Soviet territory was ordered point to these details as proof there was a coordinated effort to give Plane 8 as much of a reason to land at Vladivostok as they could get away with. However, opponents counter this by pointing out the mission was one of desperation and corners would have to be cut wherever possible. Nevertheless, many of the raiders themselves believe that York was on a mission within a mission and claim that whenever discussing the flight at reunions, he is often standoffish and dismissive. Regardless, his aircraft would actually be the first of numerous American aircraft that would touch down in Soviet territory during the war after being damaged or running out of fuel over Japan. These aircraft were then interned, and in the case of the B-29 Superfortress, re-engineered to help kickstart the Soviet strategic bomber program, emerging as the Tupolev Tu-4. When discussing acts of bravery and compassion during wartime, we often think of the soldiers who disregarded their own safety to brave enemy fire and rescue a fallen comrade, and rightly so. However, incredible displays of bravery and sacrifice are not limited to the soldiers of war. Hailing from Sweden, a European country that managed to hold on to its neutrality throughout the course of the war, Raoul Wallenberg was an architect businessman and diplomat, serving as a special envoy in German-occupied Hungary in late 1944, when German forces were beginning a wide-scale purge of so-termed subversives and undesirables, such as Jewish people. At great personal risk to himself, Raoul acted as an agent for American and Swedish organizations committed to helping Jews escape the murder that was taking place in Hungary. He created hundreds of false identities to allow Jews to pass through German checkpoints on their way out of the country and into the safety of Sweden, as well as creating safe houses for them to hide when it was not safe to travel. Incredibly, not all of his methods were so subversive, and he was frequently found interrupting the death marches to concentration camps in order to give food and water to the poor souls being led there. Despite his Swedish nationality, he was routinely singled out by German authorities, even being threatened directly by Adolf Eichmann, a man whose name has become synonymous with cruelty in the annals of history. But Wallenberg refused to give in and continued giving aid until the Soviet troops expelled the Germans and their Hungarian puppets in January 1945. Tragically, it's here that this story of heroism against tyranny takes a sad turn. As a foreign national in Hungary, he identified himself to the new Soviet authorities who immediately greeted him with suspicion, and he was arrested on charges of espionage for the United States and Sweden. Wallenberg would be held in Soviet custody for two years until Soviet authorities reported he had passed away due to a heart attack. They reported the date of his death as July 17th, 1947. The final tragedy was that the Soviets later admitted that his arrest was a mistake, a consequence of a confusing and still dangerous time in the war. That should be the end of the story, one that is both inspiring and sad. However, many questions still linger surrounding Wallenberg's demise. Since then, 
It is generally agreed that Wallenberg was executed rather than dying of a heart condition. The main evidence for this was the discovery of a journal belonging to Ivan Surov, the former head of the Soviet intelligence service, who wrote that Wallenberg had been liquidated on the orders of Stalin himself. In the Soviet sphere under the paranoid Stalin, secrets were like Russian dolls. Peel off a top layer and another one is underneath. Just how and when Raoul was, as Surov described it, liquidated, remains under debate. It is likely he was shot sometime around when the Soviets claimed he had a heart attack, but rumors amongst intelligence agencies claim he was killed, testing a new Soviet nerve agent. Furthermore, other more fortunate political prisoners who survived their incarceration by the Soviets have made numerous claims that he was kept alive for many years after his reported death. The most recent reported sighting came from prisoners released in 1975. Sadly, we may never know the truth and the ultimate fate of Wallenberg remains a mystery. It is known that Soviet authorities deliberately destroyed large numbers of files surrounding Wallenberg and other prisoners from that period, so it is wholly possible he survived longer than the Soviets claimed he did. Whether he did or not, Wallenberg is remembered with much admiration in countries like the US, Canada, and Israel for his part in helping Jews escape murder by the Nazis. Few places have had their name burned into the collective consciousness of Western civilization like Auschwitz. It remains a testament to humankind's terrible potential and the efficiency and brutality of organized mass murder. Auschwitz means many things to many people, but it seems we really don't have the full story of this hell on earth, as Auschwitz continues to reveal secrets to us year on year. In 2009, one such mystery came to light. Today, Auschwitz is maintained in Poland to commemorate those who perished and educate visitors on the horrors of the Holocaust, and it was during preservation work in 2009 that a mysterious list was uncovered, hidden away for over 60 years. The piece of white celluloid looks innocent enough. It contains 17 names of British soldiers, some of whom have been marked with a tick, while on the back, written in German, are the words now, never, and since then. Unfortunately, nothing more is known of it or what any of it means, and this has led to speculation as to its purpose. There are two dominant theories regarding the list. The first is that these were British prisoners who were murdered there, either because it was suspected they were Jewish or had Jewish ancestry, or simply that they were being punished. A little known fact is that the Auschwitz complex had a prisoner of war section known as Auschwitz E715, where a number of British and other allied soldiers were kept. In fact, Auschwitz began life as a POW camp for the thousands of Russian soldiers that were captured in the opening stages of the Eastern Front. So it is entirely possible these soldiers heralded from that part of the camp. However, it doesn't answer the question of the ticks against some names, eight in total and the words written on the back. This has invariably led to another and arguably more sinister theory regarding the list. Instead of being executed, these men were in fact members of the notorious British division of the SS. Known as the British Free Corps, around 54 men are known to have served in the British SS units, although its strength never exceeded 27 at any one time. Conscripted from British POWs, those who served in the SS were promised that they would never be sent to fight against their fellow countrymen, but would instead be used to fight Stalin and communism. They would also be used to recruit as many new members as they could from the ranks of British POWs held by Germany, but they were often met with warnings from their fellow countrymen that all that was in their future was a firing squad. After the war, Former members were interrogated and questioned as to why they joined one of the most hated organizations in history, and their responses were varied. Some joined on genuine ideological grounds, believing that communism was an even bigger threat than fascism, and eventually the allies would in their minds see sense and join Hitler in the fight against Stalin. 
Others, however, admitted that the relatively cozy life of being in the British Free Corps was preferable, at least in the short term, to being a prisoner of war. These members admitted to doing the bare minimum for the Nazis, just to keep out of the POW camps. Although, of course, the suspicion has always been that this was a lie after the fall of Hitler to spare them the death penalty. The British Free Corps was a high priority for the Nazis, and every available method was used to recruit prisoners that were deemed to be susceptible to collaborating. Intimidation and violence to encourage them to join was balanced out with good rations, preferable treatment, and even visits by prostitutes. By contrast, the prisoners who refused to cooperate lived in squalor on meager rations, endured brutal treatment on a daily basis, and were traumatized by the suffering of the Jews, also housed at Auschwitz. Given the immense mental strain these things would have placed on POWs, some of whom were just teenagers who had never been away from home before, it is perhaps understandable that some would do anything to escape. Could the ticks on the list indicate that a prisoner was susceptible, either ideologically or psychologically, to joining the British Free Corps, or that they already had joined? Few records survive regarding its members and operations during the war. The fact that the celluloid was so well hidden that it took over 60 years to find only fuels speculation that it pertains to potential or actual members of the British Free Corps. Until more evidence is uncovered, however, we may never know the truth of these 17 men and their fate. By the close of 1944, Nazi Germany appeared to be in its death throes, but on December 16th of that year, they stunned the Allies with a massive offensive in the Ardennes Forest in Belgium. Their goal was to split the Allied front in France in two and capture vital Allied fuel stocks that the Germans were now desperately short of. In the opening hours, the Germans achieved stunning successes and were once again pursuing a retreating Allied army in what history now remembers as the Battle of the Bulge. At the same time, news of the battle was overshadowing reports of a late arrival to the recently liberated city of Paris. The day before the start of the battle, a single-engined UC-64 Norseman light aircraft took off from RAF Twinwood in Clapham, UK bound for the French capital. On board was one Major Glenn Miller, who before the war was one of America's greatest musical artists in the swing genre that dominated the time period. This man was a superstar. Over a four year period, he would attain more top 10 hits in the US than either Elvis or the Beatles ever would, and was absolutely one of the giants of the entertainment industry you will instantly recognize his most famous piece of music in the mood. When the war broke out, he joined the US Army, entertaining the troops with his band. On that December day, he was flying to Paris to make preparations for his band to follow so they could entertain troops near the front line in Europe as they looked set to spend another Christmas away from home, unaware of what the Germans were about to throw at them. But Miller would never arrive in Paris. Somewhere over the English Channel, the UC-64 piloted by John Morgan and carrying Glenn Miller and Lieutenant Colonel Norman Basil vanished, and it is still missing to this day. Few wartime mysteries can claim to have birthed as many theories, some logical and some quite conspiratorial, as the disappearance of Glenn Miller. The most logical explanation seems to be that during the flight, the single engine aircraft encountered a patch of cold weather that caused its radial engine's carburetor to ice over, starving the engine of the right chemical mix to ignite the fuel. The aircraft would then have had to ditch into the freezing cold water below, where the occupants on board would have just 20 minutes to assemble a life raft before they succumbed to hypothermia. The problem with this theory is that at no point did the pilot John Morgan or anyone else on board attempt to send out a distress signal once the engine began having trouble. This would imply that whatever happened to the aircraft happened suddenly. Therefore, another popular theory is that the aircraft was destroyed due to being accidentally bombed by Allied bombers returning from an aborted operation over Germany. 
the bombers ditched their weapons in the channel in order to make them lighter and safer for landing back at their bases, and by a tragic coincidence, Miller's aircraft was flying below. According to an RAF airman by the name of Fred Shaw, he and another crewman aboard an RAF Lancaster observed their bombs exploding mid-air beneath the clouds as they ditched them, leading them to believe they had struck an aircraft. However, other airmen present contest the claim, stating that the cloud cover was so thick and the UC-64 flying so low below them that no one could have seen anything of the sort. A common and more fanciful story in the post-war period was that Miller had made it to Paris and immediately entered a brothel where he died of a heart attack. Fearing the embarrassment of such a notable star dying in such questionable surroundings, the death was covered up. But if this were true, then what happened to Morgan and Basil? Ultimately, unless conspiracy theorists want to suggest that they were murdered to protect the musician's dignity, this theory holds no weight at all. Another conspiratorial theory put forward was that he was murdered. The reasons for his assassination vary, but often include a mob hit relating to Miller's activities back home. One of the more fanciful is that he was assassinated by a faction within the American military who learned that General Dwight D. Eisenhower had dispatched him on a secret mission to negotiate with the Germans that not even President Roosevelt was aware of. Another theory is that he didn't die at all, at least not in 1944, and instead faked his death and escaped to South America. Then, of course, there are always the theories involving UFOs. In 2019, the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery announced they were beginning efforts to fund a fresh search for Miller's UC-64 after they became aware of a story from a fisherman who claims that his trawler once brought up a largely intact aircraft resembling a UC-64 in the channel before dropping it back into the sea, unaware of the significance of what he may have found. If this was Miller's plane, and if the plane was still intact, this may rule out the accidental bombing theory. As of yet, the wreckage remains lost to the sea, and so the exact circumstances surrounding the tragic deaths of Morgan, Basil, and Miller remain a mystery. And there you have just four allied mysteries from World War II. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.